ever cared for me like Jesus. That's good, isn't it? Amen? Now, I know that may have been a little slow for you, but that's all right. That's all right. We'll wake you up here in a minute. Galatians chapter number three, let's go in there. Let's open up God's word and see what he would have for us. The word of God's truth, the Holy Spirit of God's teaching power, if we would just allow. That's God's glory. It's good to be back uh, preaching and teaching this morning. Thank you, uh, team, pastoral team, and of course, the... uh, most uh, faithful servants and volunteers and the body of Christ uh, at First Bible, thank you for just always giving me a sense of calm and comfort to be away. And uh, my wife and I had a good time away last Sunday. We went to, we went to uh, church services with my uh, daughter and son-in-law and uh, uh, son and daughter doing well. And they still have two little children in tow. Grandson is now one year old, officially. We had the birthday party uh, last, uh, last Saturday, and I began that night sneaking back into their house and tying, her, tying his right arm behind his back so that he can be left-handed. And as I told the group uh, at 9 o'clock, um, I grabbed Herschel, and uh, we started, while he was in bed starting to sleep, we started pulling on his legs and his arms to stretch him out so that he can be six foot three. Uh, If he starts getting taller to be a basketball player, then we're going to push him back in. We just wanted to play baseball. We're not too tall, left-handed, it would be good. Um, But, you know, we'll see. Um, But thank you, Lord, for being able to be away. It's good to be back in the temple with all of you this morning preaching and teaching the word, hanging out a little bit together. Uh, we have uh, our last volleyball Sunday tonight, co-ed volleyball. Looking forward to that. Uh, two more hours of refereeing on the ladder, which is always complete joy for my Achilles and for my knees. But it's all right. A little whining uh, is okay. It's just there's no whining in baseball. And so we'll just whine at the volleyball court. But it's been a good year. We've had a sweet time together in the fellowship of uh, different people. There's probably half people from First Bible, half people outside of our church, and, and the devotions have been great. We've done league devotions every week, and it's great. Um, I asked uh, uh, the different crew, the, the, the pastors, to be able to do them, and they've done a tremendous job, and, and so praise the Lord. It's good to be able to minister to others when the the draw and propensity in our flesh, of course, is to minister to ourselves. But in the Holy Spirit, we desire to minister to others. And uh, that's where we're at in the book of Galatians. We're here in chapter number three. Chapter three and four get a little tough. Uh, you say, well, one and two are pretty tough. And there was, of course, the argument and contention between Paul and Peter and sorting out doctrine when it came to legalism. And it continues. And, of course, Peter and Paul going at it uh, in a good way, in a spirit-filled way, it says the Bible says that Paul withstood him. He went to him as Peter had brought in uh, rules and laws to follow, brought the law back in after the churches of Galatia had experienced Holy Spirit of God, uh, salvation in the name of Jesus. The gospel had changed their lives. They were lost. Now they're saved. They're, they're born again. They're living in the liberty in Christ. And then, hey, There's a church leader out there that started the church back in the book of Acts a few uh, years ago, and he brings in his legalism flavor, whether it's the circumcision or whether it's what you can eat or drink or or anything like that. You can't sit with the Gentiles and all that. And so that's where we were a couple weeks ago, finishing up chapter number two. And again, as we come to the three, we realize that, um, hey, it doesn't quite go away, this legalism thing. Um... Because it has a tendency to creep in at different places depending upon the circumstances. And the scriptures teach us to look at the liberty in Christ. And as the title of the series goes, free to live faith. By the way, a week from today is Resurrection Sunday. That began your freeness when you accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. He fulfilled all the law. He did the finished work 
on the cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection. He fulfilled all the law. The law is there to condemn us and show us that we cannot fulfill it so that it shows us that in our own righteousnesses, which are as filthy rags before God, we need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the simplicity of the gospel powerfully did save these believers, this church, the body of Christ at the churches of Galatia. But again, as we celebrate next Sunday, many people will go, hey, this is my one Sunday to come to church or two or three. Praise the Lord, I'm glad you came anyway. Please come and make sure that if you regularly come, you get here early if you want your favorite seat, okay? Because we move the seats around all the time just to mess with you so you might not get your favorite seat. We also turn the air conditioning on today just to make sure it works. Doesn't everybody feel nice and chilly? And Doesn't it feel great? Yeah. I had to make sure it worked. I turned it down to 62. I put it back up. It's all right now. Just kidding. Just kidding. If it was a 62 here, you'd all be chattering. But we, again, are in the scriptures looking at something that's very applicable to the church, applicable to us today. And when I think about how we often want to find a place where we can fulfill things about God, or we want to live in a way that's pleasing to God, yet, as the Galatian people learned, they were doing it absent from the Holy Spirit of God. That's kind of the way it goes. Many people say, hey, thank you, God, for sending your son Jesus. I called in the name of the Lord to save me. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, but the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I called in the name of the Lord to save me. He did. The Bible's true. The scriptures are true. Hallelujah. I have a, I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I'm now in the book of life. Hallelujah. Right? For five of you, you're really happy that you're saved. So praise the Lord. When that happened... You decided, some of you, to go, okay, thank you, God, for saving me. Now, just let me do this thing myself. God, you did a great work in my life to give me a new life. You've taught me some Bible. You've shown me some things. But now, just, just sit back, God, and let me show you how I'm going to do it my way. The phrases start coming to mind. I got this, I got to work on this, I'm working on this, I've got to get those things taken care of. And we don't look at what the Word of God teaches us, especially from the Old Testament to the New and examples of David all the way through to Paul the Apostle. You know what? It's not those works that you think you need to do after salvation that will please God. Because God, it says, will work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now the things that you do are in his pleasure because they are of him, because they're led by the Holy Spirit of God and not a long list of things that you have been told that you have to do to earn God's favor even after salvation. We've been covering that quite a bit. So a lot of good moral people are walking around. And good moral character is noticed and admirable. Isn't it? Don't you like people that have good character? Oh, so you like people that have bad character. Okay, that's fine. There's plenty to go around. But I'm talking about people that are really good. Hey, he's a good guy. He's a good gal. You know what? That guy, he's such a great guy. So what is the source of your godly, I mean, excuse me, your good moral character? There's a lot of good moral people around a lot of good moral people that even after salvation are just being good moral people. Here's where I'm headed. My fear is that for Christians, that good morals is their whole Christianity. That comes from a lot of years of being saved in my own life looking at me. What's the difference between me with my good moral character and someone that I meet that's a good person? They're never, ever going to say, there's something different in you. They're never, ever going to say, wow, there's a power and presence of someone other than you here. It's got to be supernatural. Should not our walk and talk in good character be about the Holy Spirit of God in us? In our discipleship ministry which I will have a little announcement for you at the end of service. 
Pastor Brian, who comes on staff this coming week officially on April 1, and it is April Fool's Day, so that's pretty cool, but it is true he is coming on staff. And next uh, Sunday, of course, is Resurrection Sunday. The following Sunday is the 11th. We're going to start a 9 o'clock hour called Discipleship Hour. If you have a handout that you got back in January, you put it somewhere in the house, you look in the back and you say, Discipleship Hour at 9 o'clock, when are we doing that? Ten days after Brian comes on board full-time as staff. And he's going to talk a little bit about discipleship, and he's going to talk a little bit on his first four weeks are going to be on a disciple's heart and what it means to be a disciple. And maybe you've never gone through anything having to do with one-on-one discipleship, or you don't even know what it means. He's going to answer those questions those four Sundays, so you need to jump into that. How do I do it? Call the office or just jump in there and show up on that day, and you're going to find out what it means to be a disciple, the heart of a disciple. I say all that to say this. Many of you have gone through some type of discipleship. How many of you have been gone through some, some Bible lessons and learning the Bible one-on-one or in a group? Just raise your hand. Oh, gosh, tons of you. Many of you, all of you I can see. I bet you some of you raised your hands online and I couldn't even see you. Ha, huh, that was funny. And you get to the lesson on the Holy Spirit of God and there's people teaching the Holy Spirit of God lesson and I wonder how much they really know about the God of glory who resides inside of them, inside of me. Church, my fear is that as you and I walk through this faith in Jesus Christ, that we have nixed out or canceled out or nulled the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And thus we have to find some way of showing people that we are Christian. And so we're thinking, okay, God, you used to be my source for doing right things, but I don't know anymore. Now the Holy Spirit, I'm going to put you down, put you on the side, and you know what? As I said earlier, I fear that many Christians have said, hey, yes, I do right. I am kind of righteous. I I try to live a life like da-da-da-da-da, or I'm trying to do what I'm trying to do. And yes, yes, it's okay, it's a good thing. But I wonder, are we like the Pharisees? who are lost religious people who believe they can earn their way to heaven by somehow justifying themselves, or are we the Judaizers? The Judaizers who were Jews at one time, and then they get converted to Christianity, now they know Jesus Christ as Savior, but they're still trying to bring the law back in. They're trying to say, okay, yes, I got saved, I'm born again, I'm a Christian, but you know what, isn't there a bunch of laws that I need to continue to do in order to be sanctified by God and make God happy? I said... Paul breaks down some stuff here. This is rough because he's coming right after a major matter in the church, a major matter for us. Now, all of you in here would say, I trust the Bible. I trust this book on my lap or in the electronic version. It might be better in the electronic version. I don't know. But you trust this Bible. It's the Word of God. It has everything you need for faith. It has everything to you, for you to, hey, get saved first of all, second of all, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Some people, and I know, I was one of them for so long, and it's a battle for not to be pulled back into it. The same people that have said, hey, I believe every single word in the Bible. I believe in everything that it says. and has all the answers for things that I need to do in my life. But they, in some form or fashion, still support a legalistic view of living this Christian life. When the very Bible that they believe every single word about preaches and teaches against it. Are we not confused? Yes, we are. And I was for a long time in my life. To think that I could still somehow merit God's favor when it's unmerited favor that's called grace. Somehow, some way, I've got to make my way to him and up to him after he's already saved me because he came down to me. What's your point, Pastor? Very simply is this. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the way we're to live. Now, we get drawn back in, don't we? We get drawn back into a legalistic view. We get drawn into doing a few nice little things in the law. 
And Paul the Apostle says, look, though, and he's not like, oh, you awful, wicked people, you're cast off into hell. No, I'm saying and mentioning that about the, the whole truth of that is because guess what? We've all been in that place somewhat or somehow, and maybe some of you are still in there. And you're in a place where you go, hey, I understand what you're talking about, Pastor. I feel like I'm morally rich. I'm a really good person. I, I do a lot of good things, but yet I'm spiritually poor. I'm spiritually poor. That ought not to be the way we ought to be. People say that we need revival in the church. Yes, we do. You can teach on an awful lot of things. Sometimes you need to stop teaching and just start doing. So let's take the teaching this morning from Paul the Apostle in five verses and say, okay, morally rich, that's good. Yet, spiritually poor is not a way to live. Because it's tiresome, it's weary. You're wore out from attempting to keep the law to please God after you've been saved and you desire to just live by grace. He can't forgive me. I've left five years on the table. I've done nothing for the Lord. Put it down. Well, I can't get a handle on things. I keep on falling back into sin. Put it down. You say that sounds so easy. When you experience the things of God, it's not living experientially only. Because anything that you experience in God by his grace and his mercy must be backed up by his truth. But when you experience God's liberty in Christ, backed up by his word, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who desires to me to be spiritually rich in his Son, Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit of God from this beautiful Word of God. That's what he wants to teach us today. That's what he wants to show us. Galatians chapter number 3, verse number 1. Go there with me. Let me read these first five verses and give you a little bit of outline overview of the whole chapter and then just come onto this for a few minutes and then we'll make some application here in a moment. What a great start to the chapter. Do you like being called foolish? Oh, that's a tough word. You do a Bible study, you're going, oh my goodness, foolish things, being a fool. <sighs> oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. That means that some of those believers in the church of Galatia, the churches of Galatia, had actually witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's telling us right there, hey, evidence, right there, evidently set before you. It's whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Did you know that? They saw him crucified. As much as Paul preached about it. Verse number two. This only, what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. What have you picked up on? Did you actually grab a handle on what you have by faith? Or did you do it by the works of the law? Verse number three. Are you so foolish don't you feel as though he's just personally speaking to us as believers for some of us who have wrestled through so much? Having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Do you really believe that you can say just certain amount of prayers to God and that'll just assuage do you believe that you can do certain things that are just going to be? Let's follow the scriptures and what it teaches us properly that we pray without ceasing. That covers the whole gamut. But no, 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 no. We're going to go back to some other scriptures that feed our law fest, our flesh fest, 
our way of going about life where we have to have a certain amount of order in laws and rules that we have to follow. God's saying through his scriptures, Paul is saying to the churches of Galatia, these believers, are you so foolish being begun, having begun in the spirit? You got saved, born again, the spirit of God transformed you into a new creature. And now you're going to be made perfect. You're going to be like Jesus by the flesh. I told you this is tough stuff. Verse 4. Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Do you really think the walk with Jesus Christ that you, that you suffer? Because when you identify with Jesus Christ and say, people, I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God is taught, and when it's taught, when I open the Bible and God teaches me directly, when I have somebody else in a classroom setting preach and teach the Bible, I have something going on in me. Well, that's the Holy Spirit of God teaching in his ministry of teaching, and he's revealing things to you, and he's reproving things, and he reproves the loss and their sin and their judgment. He, he's doing, the Holy Spirit's at work. Do you and I really think that in our minds that all the suffering that we've gone through in the Lord was for nothing? Absolutely not. That's what Paul's saying to the church of Galatia. It is not in vain that Christ suffered for you. And it's not in vain that you are crucified in him and living the faith that he has. Not the faith that you want to settle for. You see, verse number 5 then comes and says, He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, that's God the Father, he ministers the Spirit. Understand, doctrinally, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ told the disciples about what he is actually going to, what's going to happen, and how he's going to be brought. And the Father's going to minister to you the Spirit, believer, and work miracles among you. In those early church days, there was miracles done. It was miracles to reveal the gospel, miracles to reveal to the Jews that it was Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Do you, you saw all that. Doeth he it by the works of the law? Is that, is that how God works? By the law? Is that how the Spirit works? By the law? Or by the hearing of faith? By the hearing of faith. In a simple outline in looking at this simple chapter, by the way, that's Galatians 3 and I said earlier, you know, I was away not preaching for a week. I kind of lost my, you know, I don't know how to do any things up there, but I'm sure nobody noticed my mistake, so thank you. In Galatians 3, when you see this, there's a lot coming to us. But Paul is laying out his arguments for grace. And his first argument for grace is for were these first five verses that we're going to cover and finish up on here in the next few minutes. It's Paul's personal argument. It's a personal argument. He's making it personal, and he's making it personal to the church that's a church plant here, the churches that are church plants here in the churches of Galatia. And he's, he's making it so that they can say, hey, this is something that happened in Paul himself. That's how he confronted Peter. And that's the, the, the essence of what's behind all of this in him is that he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He understand by going to Jesus' Bible Institute he definitely was trained in ministry and he understood the depth of this personal walk with the Lord by grace. And his argument for grace was to see that, hey, the Holy Spirit will do the work if you just open the Word of God. If you don't open the Word of God, you're flying by the seat of your pants. That's all it is. It's your spirit and your spiritualism because God didn't make you as a spirit being, but when you're born again, now you're a Holy Spirit born again, and you have the Holy Spirit of God, and he desires to work in you. But guess what? When you grieve him, when you quench him, that's your call. When people say, I keep on calling to God, I don't feel like I'm saved, I don't ever get any understanding of the Bible, I wonder where I'm at, you better check and see if you're really born again. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not about your own righteousnesses. You're lost. Or on the other side of it, you're definitely saved, but you have gone through this legalism, law-abiding, fleshly following way for a while, and you just need to come and fall on your face and say, Father, would you welcome me back like the prodigal father? 
would you take me back? I know I got saved and born again a few years ago. I just wandered so far away from you. Would you take me back? And you know what the father will do? He'll come off the stoop of his house and he'll run to you. And he'll grab a hold of you and he'll kiss you. <laughs> My son was dead. Now he's alive. Start a feast. He's back. And I love him. And now it's now let's live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. The other two pieces, and I'll come right back in this outline, are verses 6 through 14. That's Paul's scriptural argument. He gets into the scriptures, he uses the Old Testament, and he breaks it down for us, okay? That's Paul's scriptural argument for grace. And then, of course, he'll do verses 15 through the end of the chapter, he'll do the logical argument for grace. Sometimes you and I just need some simple logic. Of course, when you see next week, oh, excuse me, that'll be Easter and Resurrection Sunday. When we come back after Easter, we'll look at the Abrahamic law and everything that was fulfilled through Abraham, and you see that God counted him righteous for his faith. God's good that way. So when you go back to those first five verses, let me just give you a couple of thoughts. Oh, foolish Galatians, I want you to be reminded of something. I just want to give you a thought here in some of the, just really uh, a little bit of background of this. I want you to keep in mind what Paul the Apostle is doing here. He's telling us very simply this. When I look at what you have, church, you and I go back to him and say, thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me a new life. Thank you for putting me in a place where as the Holy Spirit convicted me, the Holy Spirit worked in me, the Holy Spirit did an amazing work in me, and I saw everything that the Holy Spirit did that I go, wow, the word of God was brought to me. Somebody showed me the Bible. It told, they told me, hey, just read this verse. Read this verse. Let me tell you a verse. All of sin that comes short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Did you know that it says it in the Bible that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved? Did you know there's none righteous, no, not one, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy? And as that word of God's coming to you, the word of God's coming to you, the Holy Spirit of God comes behind you and goes, yeah, that's you, Mark Brown. You're lost. You're trusting your religion. Some of you are trusting your Baptist religion because you think the Baptist religion is better than the Lutherans. You're better than the Episcopals. You're better than the Methodists. You're better than the Catholics. Watch it. Because the Holy Spirit comes right behind the Word of God and says, hey, this is you that needs Jesus Christ as Savior. But you not opening up the Word of God, what do you expect the Holy Spirit of God to do? He has an office and he has character and he is God. And after you got saved, born again, it says in Ephesians 1 that you were sealed to the day of redemption. It says in my Bible that you are now in the body of Christ by 1 Corinthians 12. It says the Holy Spirit inhabits the believer in 1 Corinthians 6. It says that the Christian should now walk in the Spirit. Galatians chapter number 5, you live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Our disobedience grieves him. We also quench him. The Holy Spirit of God is real. And he is in you and me. And the Holy Spirit will fill us. You know why? Because bottom line is you're going to spend time in the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit of God is going to have more of you. So the Word of God comes alive more. I said, boy, that's a nice little discipleship lesson. The sad part about it is most of our Christian life is filled with moral, good moral character over a bunch of good Christian lessons that you heard and you just said, okay, that sounds nice. In the meantime, you're spiritually empty. You're spiritually poor. You're morally rich yet spiritually empty or spiritually poor. That's a sad place to be. Let's turn this thing around a little bit. When I think about what Paul the Apostle did in these five verses, God just kind of led me to these questions. See the questions? At the end of verse number three question mark. At the end of verse number two, excuse me, verse number one, 
question mark. Verse number two, question mark. Verse number three, twice. Are you so foolish? Question. Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Question. Verse number four, have you suffered so many things in vain? Question. Verse number five ends with a question mark. Oh, by the hearing of faith. Paul the Apostle is bringing lots of questions here. So, I want to answer all those questions over the next few minutes and give some real simple practical direction from the scriptures as to what God would have us do. Because when you and I settle for, again, that moral life instead of what the Holy Spirit can do, we'll go 20, 30, 40 years of just being a religious person that Paul's talking to right here. So as the Holy Spirit's talking to you this morning, maybe it's to a place where you go, I don't want to be called foolish by God. First principle, the bewitchment is real and prevalent. You need to clean out your mind. Bewitched. Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter number 8 is the only other place that we would see this. He is a demon-possessed, lost religious man who the Bible says later in Acts chapter number 8 is in a bond of iniquity. The bond of iniquity. That is a Satan oppression through the world that he is overseeing. And the be bewitchment goes after your mind. The bewitchment, bottom line is it charms you. That sounds nice. It's charming. It messes with your mind. You can do whatever you want to do and you become bewitched. You need to clean your mind out. You and I need to watch out what happens here because we become spiritually poor, but we're morally rich. It says up on the, up on the screen in one of the Bible verses that I grabbed on this, if you, turn, if you wanted to turn there, you can just look up on the screen. It's 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. I use a few verses. Verse number 1 says, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I am espoused to you, you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Hey, church, we're the bride of Christ. You are supposed to be chaste virgin, pure, and you are supposed to be only wed to Christ. But I fear, verse 3, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that preaches, excuse me, he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or ye receive another spirit which is ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. It goes to the end of the chapter in verse number 13. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Verse 15 is up on the screen. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Wow. Satan has a way of bringing his own ministers down to show you a different kind of righteousness. And that righteousness is legalism. That righteousness is obeying the law only to forsake the Holy Spirit of God doing his work. Because he wants you to be a carnal guy, a carnal gal, trying to please the Lord by fulfilling the law. And you've been bewitched, foolish Galatians. The second thing I want you to see here is this. When you get up on the screen, you say, you say, hey, the argument. Well, we had the argument in chapter number one, chapter number two. It's continuing. Paul is being tough with his church people. So here we are, and the Holy Spirit of God's leading us to this and going, the argument is coming, and it is necessary. You need to cleave to the faith. We know that that term applies to being married. We understand that it's cleaving to the one that you are with. And the word cleave, of course, means to remain with, to continue with one, to hold fast to. That the grace of God received in the gospel, that's the cleave. Look up on the screen. It says there in Acts chapter number 11, as the word is being broken out here, and you say, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. You and I need to cleave to the Lord, cleave to the faith, do you really believe? Do you trust? Do you have faith? I hear more Christians than ever saying, do I really have faith? Do I really have any faith? I can't answer that for you. But what happened to your faith? Well, pastor, tell me what to do to have faith. I give you five things to do. You go do them, and now you've pleased me. 
another carnal move, another legalistic move by the pastor, now I have power over you. I'll come back to the pastor, I'll come back to the pastor, I'll come back to the pastor. If somebody's going to disciple you one-on-one, don't you dare put the burden of learning how to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ only on the disciple maker. They're there to guide you, teach you, and lead with you and gather up some fruit for you to follow. But I promise you this, the Holy Spirit of God is not sleeping at the wheel. He can do a whole lot better job than I can or any of you. Well, I'm such a great teacher. You better get rid of yourself and your ego. You're not that good. The only reason you're good at anything is because God gave it to you through the Holy Spirit of God and said, hey, cleave unto the Lord. Cleave unto that faith. You better believe in him. It's faith in him. We are so caught and stuck. Let's stop. Let's stop right now. Putting all our faith and trust in man. I will let you down. I don't want to, but I will. Because you'll think that I was going to do something that I didn't do. Yeah, I got a little sighted now. My stinking blood pressure is about 190 over 120. (laughs) I'm not as young as I used to be. The The next one says this. The responsibility is daily and important. I want this for you. I mean that. I want you to be free in the word and the spirit. I want you to, on your own, go and dig it out. Sit here. And he'll come and meet with you. You're going to pray. And maybe you've probably spent half the time praying. You cry. And half the time yelling and screaming. Half the time mad at you. That's three halves. Oh, gosh. Wait a minute. A third, third, third. But what is it? It's a responsibility every day. And it's important. You need to give consent to the Holy Spirit is what I'm saying every day. Give him consent. We give consent to so many people, so many things. We give consent to this government. We've got consent so much. Would you also give consent to the Holy Ghost? Would you please let him have permission to teach you, show you, and have you free, free from the law that binds you to please your flesh and somehow, some way think you can fulfill it? It says up on the screen this in the Bible passage that God led me to choose up there, I believe I've got Romans chapter number 8. Oh, gosh. There's the whole thing. But let me just read these two verses. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. The law is weak. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. Condemned sin in the flesh. That's the faith that you live in the Lord Jesus Christ, not the faith that you live in yourself. And we add Jesus Christ to it. Accept it. Live in it. You're free to do so. That's what he's saying because verse number four says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. When you're saved, born again, people see you doing right things and they're going, why did you do that? Because I love Jesus Christ, not because I'm trying to please you. So the natural result is your cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But your cup's going to run over when... The Holy Spirit of God's the one that's leading you, teaching you, moving in you. You're cleaving to the faith that he has given you. You're looking more like Jesus Christ. This is good. A lot of you know what I'm talking about. A lot of you don't. Well, let's kind of let's kind of just do it all together here. Because the body of Christ, we have the power in the Holy Spirit, the power in the Word of God. We have the power in the church. We have the power in the resurrection. We have the power in the gospel. That's where the power is, not in you and me. Not me yelling and screaming and hollering. The next one says this. The acquainting is right and honorable. What are we acquainted with? Look at verse number four. What does it say there? Have ye suffered so many things in vain? Acquainted with his suffering. Have you ever suffered for the gospel's sake? I mentioned a little bit earlier. Maybe we've gotten so soft and such sissies that that's why we don't break out the gospel. Break out the gospel. You don't have to get fancy about it. Right, Lee? Don't get fancy about it. You don't have to get fancy about it. If there's one thing in your life that you really would love to change, what could it be? Oh, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to have some more money. <laughs> That's funny. Just call up your government to send you a check. <laughs> but that's what we do. 
So I'm morally rich. I'm governmentally rich. I'm spiritually poor. I don't want to suffer. Oh, yes. I will tell you the sufferings of this present world are nothing compared to the glory that one day we'll see. You keep that in mind when you're going through some tough things for Jesus Christ's sake. I know losing friends and people, and when they pass away, it's suffering, but I'm not talking about that suffering. I'm talking about the separation unto the Lord, and then he separates you unto him. He sanctifies you, and you are Jesus' sufferer. Woo! It says up in here in Philippians chapter number one. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ. Just like the salvation that was given to you, this suffering's been given in the behalf of Christ. By the way, it's all by grace that he handed it to you. Here. <laughs> Here. You can suffer with Christ. Not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. It's a gift. Hallelujah. What a great way to walk out this life in Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, as the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God says, for by grace, <laughs> through faith, I'll give you a little suffering <laughs> in Christ. Verse 30 says this, having the same conflict which, is, which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. He's writing from jail, suffering because he loves Jesus Christ and he's preaching the gospel. Was it in vain for Paul? Absolutely not. You suffered a little bit for Jesus Christ. People been, you've been embarrassed a little bit. Was that in vain? Was that for nothing? I texted with somebody the other day and said, I can't believe all the suffering I'm going through. I went to do this and I went to that. I said, Praise the Lord. The person thought I was nuts. Then I sent him a couple verses. I actually sent him these verses because they were fresh on my mind and my heart from preparing. The last one is this. Verse number five. Now verse number five is kind of crazy. There's a lot there. But let me narrow it down. Oh, praise the Lord. I'll have to read it without my eyeballs. Oh my goodness. Lee, you going to help out the old man? Thank you very much. Thank you. You're the best. Oh, gosh, I can see now. Thank you. Hear therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you. Doeth he it with the works of the law? Does God the Father who ministers to you the Spirit, does he do it? Does the Spirit do it because he has to fulfill some kind of law? Oh, no, he says, or by the hearing of faith. Again, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God's doing something as you're hearing his word spoken and his word read. That's who's doing this, by the way. I'm not doing the thing. The Holy Spirit is the one doing this. The foundation is grace and faith. That's the gospel. It's his grace. It's faith. It's confidence in the gospel and the gospel alone. And when you have confidence in something else, well, I can't wait for Easter Sunday. I'll be reminded. You can be reminded right now. Amen. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're lost, how do I know? Oh, you know. I don't have to tell you. God does that. The Holy Spirit does that. It's whether or not you're going to act. Because the Holy Spirit does it after the word of God's presented to you. The Holy Spirit comes through and says, hey, I'm reproving you of your righteousness, your sin, judgment. It's for by grace. It's my grace through faith. That's it. Have confidence in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 15. It says up here, and I used 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. I know we're late in time. So here you go. Verse number 18, I believe I put up there. Of course, I put a different address, but that's all right. It's 1 Corinthians 1. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. It's the cross. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper here in a few minutes. Now think about this. We're going to remember what Jesus Christ did. We're going to, I mean, let's just track in here right now. Death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. We say those three words like it all happened in five seconds. 
He suffered on the cross, that cruel cross, where all the sin was born and held. And it says in verse number 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. They all think they're so smart. We think we're so smart. We think we're just going to hoodwink God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Whew. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and so free. It says up on the screen, the doctrine of our salvation makes us spiritually rich. It is time to live faith from the depth of God's riches. He said, I don't even know what you mean. Go to discipleship hour on April 11th, right there in that classroom at 9 a.m., and you'll learn what it means to have a disciple's heart. Jesus said to the disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. You come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, but you've never ever grown. You don't know what it means to be spiritually rich, but morally, you're good. How would you like to have that flip a little bit, or just add to, you want to be morally rich, morally good, but you want to be spiritually rich. That's God's riches. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning, I want you just to really, 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 we need to examine ourselves, that's part of this, but I want you to remember what he did for you. We're one week out from celebrating the resurrection. What riches untold we have in Jesus. Please bow for a word of prayer. We're going to prepare our hearts right now for the Lord's Supper. And as my sister plays a little bit of music in the background for the Lord's Supper, let me pray with you and pray for you. Thank you, Father, for your word this morning. Thank you for how you still, only you still, do the work that you need to do. Forgive us for being stuck. Forgive us for being in a place as a church that we cleave to the things that are so untrustworthy when we ought to just cleave to the faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your faith. It's completely in the gospel that we see who you are. And I thank you most of all for our Jesus, the Savior of our souls. Thank you for making us whole. Thank you for redeeming the lost, for giving us the truth of the Word of God. Forgive us for being foolish after salvation, for walking away from the riches of your glory and the riches of your ways and the riches of the Holy Spirit and your Word. God, make this a moment of definement for each one of us. That as this defining, defining moment comes in our Lord's Supper time, that God will put our hearts on the altar for you. We love you. We thank you. We cherish this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to have you all stand, please.